if you are in a position of power, you really need to acknowledge the power that you have to make a difference and speak up. That pretending that you don't have it is a disservice to yourself and to others. So use it to advocate, to organize, and mostly to empower the young people around you. They have big ideas. They've been learning about this, you know, from day one. It's been part of their education. And we need to combine our experience, our wisdom with their ingenuity and their willingness to engage technology because they have the skills and we have some wisdom. And I think we need to find a way to combine those things in a very real way to make change happen. Welcome. This is Craig Applegath, and this is the 21st Century Imperative Podcast, the podcast series that explores the insights and approaches of scientists, designers, planners, engineers, business entrepreneurs, and other successful change makers who are finding effective ways to meet the three critical challenges posed by the 21st century imperative. These are, how will we continue to live on our planet without destroying our biosphere? How will we repair and regenerate the environmental damage we have already caused? And how will we adapt to the escalating impacts of climate change? Each episode will feature an interview with an individual whom I think you will find not only inspiring, but also very relevant to helping you answer the question, what can I do to meet the challenges of the 21st century imperative? My guest today is Michelle Schwab, an architect and the director of innovation at BDP Quadrangle. Michelle's passion for the environment and her desire to positively impact communities was the original impetus for pursuing a career in architecture. Michelle describes her story of becoming an architect in her recent TEDx Toronto talk in 2020, which we've provided a link to in our show notes, and talks about the importance of being able to bring both right and left brain thinking to the environmental and social challenges we now face. In her role as Director of Innovation, she is the go-to person for planning and phasing in her firm's most intricate renovation work and its large, complicated projects. Her role in the studio is to keep current with the growing body of knowledge of environmental issues and to ensure that sustainability is embedded in key decisions made by the firm and her team. This includes reviewing the firm's internal and external practices to minimize the environmental footprint of projects and heading up the studio's green team, which consults on projects and strives to provide strategies for targeting and achieving sustainability goals on every project. Michelle has also been active in many local green initiatives, such as the consultation process with the City of Toronto for the Toronto Green Standard and Bird Friendly Development Guidelines as well as the Archetype Sustainable Condo Project with Sustainable Buildings Canada. As the past chair of the Board of Directors of Sustainable Buildings Canada, she was invited to co-facilitate workshops for the Ontario Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, Path to Zero Initiative, a directive that seeks to reach zero waste, carbon, energy, and water on provincial buildings. Michelle also sat on the Executive Committee of the Board of Directors for the Canada Green Building Council, CAGBC, Greater Toronto Chapter from 2010 to 2012. In our podcast today, Michelle and I talk about some of the important strategies for mitigating carbon emissions, both operational and embodied carbon, but also about how we can design to improve our social infrastructure in order to increase climate change resilience, exploring some of the ideas she outlined in her TEDx talk. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Michelle, it's a real pleasure to have you as a guest today. In the introduction to this episode, I provided our listeners with a brief biography of your career to date. Clearly, you are passionate about sustainability and sustainable design. So why don't we start off by talking about your passion for sustainability and how it grew to become such an important part of your career? Thanks, Craig. It's a total pleasure to be here. Well, start by saying I grew up here in Toronto in the, the Toronto Ravine system, kind of in the Ravine system as a kid. Um, it was, you know, a place I turned to for a lot of my, you know, I went there for fun. I went there for my joy. I went there to, to connect. So I'd say it really had a strong connection to nature growing up. And when I went to architecture school, 
I was really sort of taken by the fact that there wasn't a lot of discussion about the environment or issues of social justice. And I found that really difficult to understand and hard to connect to. Over time, I ended up taking a couple of courses in my last year that really changed things for me. And one was on landscape design and another one was on ecofeminism. And I think both of these courses really validated some of my thinking around architecture and the environment and how architecture related to people and society and really started to teach me how I could integrate some of my passion for the environment into architecture. And that work really led to my, my thesis work, which really the, the catalysts for it were around weather and the body. So it was looking at nature and architecture. Uh, the site was Leslie Street Spit. And as you know, that's a site that is a, a human landform and it was put there. So, to- so evolved f- from when you were a student. Yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Evolved from when I was a student. Um, And so when I looked at the Leslie Street Spit, I thought it's sort of an interesting place because it's a place that was, you know, human made, yet nature had grown up between the cracks. And to me, there was something really poetic about that and made me think, well, what does that give us the right to do? How do we deal with this? And so, as I started to study the site, I realized that um, several different microclimates had evolved on the site. And this had come out of the fact that the land formation was made in very different ways. On On the east side, it's predominantly concrete and rock that was, you know, from the subway tunneling and from demolition of buildings, whereas on the on the west side, it's predominantly sand where they dredged out the bottom of the Don River and the Outer Harbor Marina. And so, you had totally different plant life that grew there. And so my thesis was all about looking at these different microclimates and letting the landform tell us what the architecture should be in terms of form, in terms of response to nature, in terms of even the program. So it ended up being a series of gardens and pavilions um, that responded to weather and the body. Um, and that was really that was really the driving force. It's so prescient. I mean, your first two courses and your thesis so presaged what we're all concerned about now. Well, it it was interesting because I remember having a conversation with a professor when I finished school and saying, well, what do I do with this now? Because going into practice was quite difficult after coming out and being really connected to the work that I did. And she said, I don't really understand how you have this social justice bent because that's not, (laughs) that's not how, that's not how it's taught. And I remember one of my uh, professors on my crit panel had said, whoa, this is so personal. Like, why are we talking about personal wellness in public space? And I said, because that's what I think it needs to be. And yet that's so much about what the world cares about right now. Yeah. It's wonderfully perfect setup. Yeah. From here, I ended up in healthcare architecture for about five years. I worked on hospitals and I was kind of amazing me how much plastic we put into hospitals. And so I, you know, had asked to go on a, a conference. And I went to this, my very first green building conference. and. Uh, ended up connecting with these people and came up with this idea, you know, this one person who was just so inspiring and he you know, didn't know that much. And he said, somebody's just got to start. Someone's got to be the catalyst. So, you know, I started this green team and we started to look at what we should do. And so I did the same thing. I went back to my office. I said, this is what we need to do. These are the resources that I need. And can we do it? And so I spent some time doing that and building up a sort of a strategy for healthy healthcare which is what led me to where I am now at Quadrangle. Because I looked at, at um, when I joined Quadrangle, now BDP Quadrangle, I had this passion for sustainability, but I was looking around at the buildings that were being built. And even though I loved institutional, the buildings that were being built were, they were all private sector development, tons of residential. And I thought, well, maybe that's where I can affect change because that's where the change needs to happen. And I loved the work that Quadrangle was doing. There was just a lot of, stuff that was really well-placed within the community that had really thought about the, the public realm. And that piece intrigued me. And that sort of led to, to where I am now. So taking that a bit further, Michelle, what are the most important lessons you've learned from your work and your role now as a director of innovation at your firm about how to increase both the awareness of the key issues related to climate change and how to design to limit and adapt to climate change? I think there's a couple of things. The main one is really that we're stronger together. And by that, I mean, 
you know, architecture isn't a one person game. It's really about our ability to communicate the key issues and the importance of the changes that need to happen. Uh, so I think it's really critical to have great skills at leading and participating in complex discussions, mm, listening yes. to multiple voices. Like to me, that so is, true. Is, is key. And, and, and there's multiple levers, multiple levers to be pushing on, right? There's the, there's the day-to-day project work, but then there's things like, you know, policy and advocacy and, you know, volunteering on boards. I think all of those pieces tie into that because, I mean, what I found uh, when I was first starting out, you know, in my interest in the workplace and sustainability was when I, I got onto the board of Canada Green Building Council, the local chapter, and I started to meet these other one-off people, you know, the other sustainability advocates within their, within their firms. You know, now there's kind of lots of people within firms, but at the time, you know, there were a lot of one-offs and we would meet and talk and, you know, find ways to empower one another and help each other raise our voices. And I think that, that made a huge difference. Um, And so I think now in my current role, it's really about leading by example, speaking up myself, Mm -hmm. but even more than that, it's advocating for those around me to have a voice when they want to raise these issues with their clients, when they want to raise these issues with municipalities, it's empowering them to say the things that are going to gain traction, right? Because you have to speak in a way that that person will listen. So sometimes you want to say it in this way, but a person will only listen because their drivers are different from yours and you have to be able to do that. So trying to help people around me to speak in a voice that that will be heard. Yes, you alluded to that in your 2020 TEDx Toronto talk. And you talked about how architects and society can best mitigate and adapt to the huge challenges of climate change we now face. I thought you had some very smart insights. By the way, we'll put a link to that TED Talk in the show notes. Central to your talk, you suggested that as architects and designers, there were two key approaches to mitigating and adapting to climate change. One was how we design buildings to reduce carbon, and the other was how we plan neighborhoods and cities to connect people and create a more resilient social infrastructure. Taking that idea, I'd like to ask you two intertwined questions, and I think we can spend as much time as you want to talk about them. They're important. The first question is, what is the most important thing you think we can do as architects, engineers, and planners to reduce carbon emissions? That's been sort of the question for the last 30 years. But also with that, Second question is referring to your point on social infrastructure. What are the most important things we can do to increase the depth and quality of our social infrastructure to increase our resilience to present and future climate change impacts? And there are big bulky questions that I'm asking them together because I think from what I've heard you talk about before, they're intertwined. So is that a good starting point for talking to those? Yeah, there's there's tons there. So <laughs> there's no wrong answers in this kind of question, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, no, there's there's lots in there. Um, it was tough getting it down to twelve minutes or whatever it was I, I did in the talk, but I think first and foremost for me as architects, you know, engineers, planners, it's just the acknowledgement that we we have a lot of power. You know, we create the built environment for people, and it's an enormous responsibility. I mean, almost 40% of global emissions come from buildings, and that's huge. And the reason I say it's important to acknowledge your power is it's because with that power, we have the potential to make great change. And especially in these positions, we're often asked to give our opinion, and we should have opinions on these things, and we should be able to advocate for the right things. So, you know, on the, on the institutional side, I'd say a lot of the right things are already happening in, in buildings. There are, you know, third-party certifications. There is, you know, usually fulsome energy reporting and that sort of thing. And on the private sector side, it's a little bit more challenging. So on the private sector side, you know, developers want to have a level playing field, right? They're competing. And, um, and, and their pro forma is tough. Every penny counts. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So unless they have other drivers, and these days there are a lot of other drivers, there's future climate, there's ESG reporting, we could get into that stuff if you want to, but 
at the very basic level, there's meeting the municipal standards. So I feel like one of the big pieces, and I've mentioned this a little bit before, is just around advocacy. So advocating for major changes to be made to building codes and sustainability development guidelines, I think is huge. And I think we need to engage the municipalities and support them in making these changes and encouraging them to make those changes because they don't want to make them too fast to get, you know, to get backlash, but we want to encourage them to be pushing the envelope. And if they see that they have the support of the local professionals, they are bound to push a little harder on it. And then I think the other piece is really just making sure we have these conversations on all projects, regardless of whether that is a priority of the particular company. I think it is essential to have this discussion, to be advocating for these changes, and to point out the fact that our codes and standards aren't keeping up with the rate of change. So we know this. We know that we're designing using energy model files that are based on you know, historical weather, but most people don't know that. And though we know the climate is changing and we see that it's changing, we're not designing for that. And so I do think it's that we have some responsibility as professionals to at least state this. Like, yes, this is what we have to do, but this is also the reality of what's happening. And I think this is part of this sort of accelerating change that's happening. And then, you know, thinking architecturally, of course, you know, one of the biggest things that we can do is to do what we do best, is to really, really show the vision and inspire others towards that vision. And this vision really needs to prioritize passive design principles. The base building needs to respond to the environment that's around it, you know, needs to account for the fact that, you know, passive shading should be a part of it, like mechanical systems later. But let's look at the architecture. The architecture itself has to work. And I think we need to be questioning the status quo. I mean, constantly questioning what we did last time and staying on top of the science, sharing the science, and not in a, you know, trying to change the world kind of way, but in a way that describes why it is that this makes good business sense to be designing for the future and to be thinking about the future now. And that that can be a tough call, especially, you know, something like a condominium is very different than a, you know, an intentional rental building where someone's keeping it over in time and in thinking about things like durability and maintenance. So those are a couple of different things. You mentioned vision as being very, very important to change. What do you think are the best ways to drive large-scale change and large-scale action, the kind needed to move us in the right direction in solving climate change and related ecological challenges? You've been very, very articulate about We need change, and we're responsible as architects to uh, give voice to that. How do we drive change? What role do we have? I think in terms of driving large-scale change, again, I would come back to the fact that policy is, is a huge driver. And I think right now our public process is, it's a bit broken. It's a bit siloed. I think there are many city priorities, and they're often in conflict with one another, and maybe not holistically understood. Public meetings can sometimes feel like lip service. I mean, I think we've all been on both sides of the public meeting, there as the public and there as the person, you know, presenting at the public meeting. And I have to say, as the audience, I've found it a little unnerving how little attention can sometimes be paid by the professionals leading those to the opinions that are being expressed in the room. So I think that part of policy is engagement and engagement with the community. So I think to make, I think part of authentic engagement, authentic engagement with the people that are in the room. And I think that's something that we can do because what that does is it builds trust. It builds trust in public process. And I think to make large scale change, you need trust in the public process. I think it's really, really key. And I think we've seen that through the pandemic, right? It's like when, when we have felt like we didn't trust our leaders, we've, you know, things have gone off kilter when things were done with authority that made sense when they were following the science, we could follow suit and and make sense with them. You know, I was thinking recently, actually, that the city could really use an innovation process, you know, because I feel like communities know what needs to happen and what needs to change within their communities. So imagine if there was a system for collecting those good ideas within, within a community. And if there was a person whose role it was to make sure that those things happened and happened quickly, Because I think when people 
make suggestions, see the uptake, see it happen, and you see a bunch of quick wins, people are more inclined to participate in the public process. But I remember walking away from a public meeting with some of my neighbors, and uh, there was a, a, a kid with you, maybe 10 or 12 at the time, and he said, I'm never doing that again. They didn't listen to a word. Why was that? Because we were, we were talking about a project that was being built in our neighborhood, and some suggestions were being made, and, and the professional leading the meeting was really not listening, was talking around the issue, wasn't addressing them. And people kept raising the same concerns and they weren't being addressed. And I thought, oh, this is awful. <laughs> this is not what we want out of our, you know, people that are growing up. And so I, I spoke to him about it. Well, but, one, um, of the cha- one of the challenges with public meetings is that the project or plan is presented at a point when there's very little opportunity to inflect it. So the the professionals involved are defensive rather than receptive. That's I mean, they, the whole process sometimes gets set up for failure, but you're right. It, it, if it doesn't feel authentic yeah. or not feel, but actually be authentic, then, then it's pointless. Yeah. So I think, so I think it's engagement. It's around public engagement, which I feel like is a really big way to drive major change. Along that road and, and related to this, what do you think are the key challenges to improving social infrastructure and driving change. Yeah. You talked about social infrastructure in your in your TED talk and I thought it was very important. Yeah, I mean I think, you know, the public realm is absolutely key. So how does the building support community engagement? I turn a lot to Christopher Alexander's book, you know, a, mm-hmm. a pattern language. Pattern language. Yeah. Yeah, I just... Which I remember going to school, it was verboten. The book was verboten. It was not considered to be part of the architectural approved yeah. ideas yeah. at the time I went to school. But I, probably not when I was there either. It's something that I picked up as a professional, actually. <laughs> and I went through it and I thought, why? Why, why didn't we go through this? You know, it has the patterns of a city and of a block and of a room. And, and it kind of looks at the qualities of space that build community. And it takes sort of common problems to community building and proposes, you know, architectural patterns that can be combined in certain ways. So, you know, in my TED talk, I, you know, refer to, you know, a low wall or the distance between two things. It really is about those relationships that kind of make or break, you know, whether a person is going to stop and sit somewhere, whether they're going to carry on. We were working on a very specific idea that was the catalyst for my TEDx talks. And it was called uh, Neighborhood Nexts. So we were talking about creating a way to build social infrastructure in cities at a finer grain than kind of community centers or libraries. And since the majority of what's being built in the city is uh, residential buildings, we thought, well, what if you could do something with residential buildings? You know, you have to build amenity spaces anyways. And we think there's a real opportunity to make these into kind of neighborhood gathering spaces, like reimagining the amenity space as something which is more outward facing rather than inward facing. You know, typically an amenity space is something that's that's private. And we said, what what if you started to kind of blur those boundaries? So we put together this sort of neighborhood nest concept project. And um, my colleague, Ken Brooks, had described some of the kind of qualities that the space needed. And he thought it needed three things. It was the, the invitation to pause. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like well-designed thresholds, sort of uh, conditions along the public realm, like canopies or seat walls, you know, bike parking, you know, mo- movable furniture that, you know, someone could sort of take ownership of. And, 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 and seats that don't have sort of spikes on them to stop you from laying down <laughs> on them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and then the second one was um, opportunities to stay for a while. So what would make you stay? Things like different kinds of seating, furniture, like a little nook so you could have a private conversation or read a book, you know, a high table where you could have these sort of like low pressure encounters, um, a nice long table where you could sit and work for a while or soft seating where you could, you know, sit and have a longer chat with somebody. And then the third one was reasons to return. So reasons to return and, and enjoy a variety of resources So things like, you know, activities, so, you know, coffee time or event boards, farmer's market, book club. And so the concept behind this neighborhood nest was to create the sort of, you know, the physical space for it, 
But that what you also needed with that was this sort of a, a welcoming presence. Like you think of, we were brainstorming around places that we'd love to go, places within our communities. And something that all of these spaces had in common were usually a person. It was like your favorite barista or your favorite bartender, or your you know, mm-hmm. like sales clerk, whoever it happened to be. And so we thought, you know, usually in a, in a residential building, you're going to have a concierge or a security guard oftentimes, you know, whose job is to sort of keep people out, make sure the right people are, are coming in. And we thought, well, what if you just change the job description of that person? And that person's job was to welcome people and to know who was there. Like a real concierge in a hotel. Yeah. They're there to help you. Yeah, to, to connect you, to say, hey, you know, Craig's here. You know what? He's also interested in this. Hey, yeah. you know what? We're having this event tonight. We think you might enjoy it. And it would make the job more I- engaging and interesting. Absolutely. You'd probably have uh, more people interested in being part of that as opposed to, you know, stop. Yeah, exactly. No entry. <laughs> well, you think about it, a lot of these high-rise buildings, right? It, it, people don't know each other. Yeah. You know, they get they get built up really quickly. You get hundreds of people moving into a building. You've got these long corridors. And so, you know, they're sort of like vertical cul-de-sacs. Yeah. And we said, well, what, what if you could change that? And so we'd originally had this concept of resiliency centers. Like, where would people go if there was a, if there was a climate emergency? And the more we mm-hmm. talked about it, the more we realized that it needed to be a place that people were familiar with and comfortable with. Mm-hmm. Um, and that became a part of this. So we said, well, what if this neighborhood nest was, you know, that became your lobby, amenity space, your hangout space. It was open to the community. People could come in and out so that if something did happen, you would know where to go. So if there was a power failure, you'd know, you know I'm going to go by and going to see Craig who runs well, the desk. It makes, it makes so much sense because libraries can't have a, the whole population of the neighborhood in them. That's right. In That's case right. of a some sort of climate emergency or or storm or something, right? So, if every residential building, multi-unit residential, has some sort of resiliency nest, then all of a sudden, you are taking care of that vertical neighborhood. That's right. That's a real opportunity, I think. Yeah, I, I, I think so. We were tying it to, you know, the city in, in their Toronto Green Standard, one of their options is to have an amenity space. Um, they called it an area of refuge, mm-hmm. you know, a place that had, you know, 72 hours of, you know, backup power. And so we thought, well, what if you also gave this space some hard infrastructure, you know, proper heating, cooling, you know, refrigeration for medical supplies, whatever you needed, proper water, fresh air. And so that you could go to that place and warm up or cool down or charge your phone systems, you know, whatever it is you needed to do, that that would be the place that you would go. And and originally we thought of it in terms of a climate emergency, what would you do? And then we were about to release it and the pandemic happened and we thought, wow, wow, this is, rethink this. this is, yeah. <laughs> and, and we looked at it again and we thought, well, you know, is that what we need at this time, community yeah. building, when we're actually, you know, isolating? And we thought actually more than ever, that is what you need. Because then I started thinking, well, imagine if you could do your grocery shopping online, it's all coming to the central space and, you know, it was, it was the facility. Right, it changes its, it, its format, Right. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. It's no exactly. longer a place to gather. It's a place to go and get. Yes. Right. Like it. It, it has yeah. a multi multi function. Yeah. And then you start to imagine a community where you have a couple of these on the streets, and they're all sort of connected together, communication wise. And 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 it strikes me in the, the I think the reasons multi unit res or apartment buildings in in layman language I guess are so isolating is because there aren't the venues to connect. So those spaces might be the reason why two or three people connect to one another. And then all of a sudden the isolation falls because you start to know people and you start to connect. There's a reason to connect. Whereas now there's no reason you go up, you go in. You're just weird if you start talking to someone, right? (laughs) It's not normal in our society. But if there's a reason to talk to people, people love to talk to other people. It's just that sort of the right venue. When you're building that social infrastructure, you know, the, the thing that, that that ties us together, the thing that keeps a community strong, right? You know, I, my TED talk, I talked about the... Um, yeah, the Chicago study. Yeah, there's the Chicago study, for sure, yeah. from 1995. I mean, it was seven, 739 people died, right? Yeah. And, and the thing that was so interesting was that th- those two neighborhoods that were beside each other that were virtually the same. Same social economic status. Yeah. yeah. And one had done really well and one had not. And the, the big difference was the social infrastructure. 
and people knew each other and people knew each other because there was a place, place to go to meet each other and talk. And, you know, when the heat wave happened, people knew to find each other. It's like, oh, you know, Joe's missing. Yeah. We should go find Joe. Has anyone seen him? Yeah, let's go find him. Are they okay? Yeah. And a lot of what happens in that kind of a crisis is people stay home. And if people are staying home, this is when they're, they're overheating, mm-hmm. right? You want to make sure they're making it to the cooling center. You yeah. want to make sure that they're, they're not isolated. And so that's the piece that just, make, like I think about a spider web is a lot stronger, Right. If you have multiple connections to, to lots of things. Right. They tug on each other when there are troubles. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, and that to important. me is the image of, of social infrastructure. Well, that's a, that's a good segue to the next question because that's on the social side. What about the technical side? We're, we're being bombarded, inundated with people talking about artificial intelligence and IT and smart everything and the sort of internet of things. So understanding that the complexity of our cities will be key to improving social infrastructure, what role do you think machine learning and big data and artificial intelligence might really play in leveraging our ability to cope with climate change? Is there something there other than hype? For sure. For sure there's more than hype. I think part of understanding the kinds of complexity that we're talking about, you know, where we are, in the, you know, the current history of the world is going to be about finding a way to use machine learning and AI to help us to make good decisions and to make those decisions quickly. The best book that I've read on this topic is, um, it's called Thank You for Being Late by Thomas Friedman. I don't know if you've read that, Craig. Mm -hmm. Uh, We'll Um, we'll put it in the show notes. Put it in the show notes. Yeah. It's a pretty dense book, but the subheading is what I like. It's called An An Optimist's Guide to Thriving in the Age of Acceleration. So he talks about the fact that that everything is accelerating, you know, the changing technology, the changing climate, the changing, you know, markets, everything, the globalized world, all of this is converging at once. And it's too much information for all of us to take in, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's, it's just too much. We can't know everything. So we have to figure out a way to leverage this and, and how to ask the right questions. And I think it's going to take, you know, people cooperating to make the changes happen in order to adapt and prosper with all of this change that's happening. And that the outcome is really going to depend on our ability to build community, which, you know, isn't easy in an age where you have social media, where, you know, mm-hmm. a president can yeah. incite violence with a single tweet, you know, that kind of, you know, there's the, sort of the scary side of things, but then there's the real side of things, the really beneficial side where, you know, he talks about turning artificial intelligence into intelligent assistance. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was wonderful. So you look at something, you know, like where you're trying to learn, you're trying to learn math, and you go on there and you do a test and then it's creating a course that's specific to you based on what you know and what you want to know. Right. And, and stuff like that is incredible. So really, I think that big data is about helping us to make better decisions. So I think about architecture, for instance. I think about something like generative design tools. And I think the value there is getting it to do the work for us around those repetitive tasks so we can do the stuff that humans do best, you know, think about things like the, the quality of space and architecture as a community builder and integration into neighborhoods, right? Because that's something AI is not going to be able to do for us. It'll be able to tell us statistically where it should go and that part, but you think you still need the human element. To bring judgment to it. It, it can provide you with a lot of a thoughtful or at least pre-thought options, which you then can, yeah. can judge. I know in our firm's energy modeling parametric tools, that's the power is modeling various possible options or directions and then choosing the ones that make sense for the particular design context that they're in, which you just couldn't do. You couldn't do the calcs by an Excel sheet one by one. It would take forever, whereas this can lay them out very quickly Absolutely. and then you can select and then head down that path. Yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, an energy model is going to tell you that a perfect cube <laughs> Is yeah, that which, which energy, is where you want to go. You know, energy wise, the <laughs> most efficient, but then you layer on, the, you know, the pieces of what else you're trying to do, and engagement, yeah. and form, yeah. and people, and how they. Feel. And you've got all the different parameters, and you you pull one, and what does it mean to the others? Yeah, exactly. and so as you move those things, it it helps you to understand it. So part of our innovation program in house, we have these uh, idea pitches. Yeah. So 
anyone in this in the studio can can you know volunteer to do one it's a two minute pitch you have an idea you think that we should all be you know getting in line with volunteer to do a pitch right so one of my colleagues did a pitch about technology and how it's changed the design process as well as what we've designed and and his key question was you know what would you do with the extra time if you could use something like generative design to speed up a whole bunch of your processes what we have to avoid happening is having it just shrink design time, right? Because that's that's the danger there. And so when I thought about that question, it was, well, what would I do? I, I would free it up to do those embodied carbon studies, to do the extra iterative modeling, to do all of these other pieces, choose the right materials, choose the... You're doing that anyways, but you're doing it as much as you can within the time frame you had. If you had that much more time, you could go that much deeper on some of these heavier issues that we really need to be making you know, an integral part of the process. Are you worried about AI starting to replace what a lot of um, architects, engineers, and planners do now? Or will it offer more opportunities? So there's a palpable fear in many of my colleagues, architectural colleagues and engineering colleagues, about, especially younger millennials, that AI will displace what they do now. They've learned all of these skills and all of these techniques, and yet AI may be able to do it in a nanosecond where it would take them a day to do. So what do you think about that? Is that something that as the director of innovation you're thinking about? Definitely. But really what I'd say to that is it's, I think we still need to interpret what we get. Yeah. We still need to interpret the results. Bring wisdom to it. Exactly, exactly. So I want to be thinking it in terms of all of these parameters at once, but you look at architectural training, you know, you know, we got some building science, we got some structural, we got, we got a little about a lot, but I think where my education, what I, what, from what I recall, was heaviest, was really on the social side. It was really on the social science, sort of the, like, we took a course called um, iconography, where we looked at the study of icons throughout history. So you look at art and architecture. And when you look at that, it's really a representation of who society is. And I think as, as an architect, as a planner, you need to be able to understand that. And I think AI can do a certain amount, but I think you need to layer on the human interpretation and interaction with that. Because mm -hmm. AI doesn't make ethical decisions. We do. I think that's our role in it. You know, it might give you the most efficient, it might tie a whole bunch of things together, but ethically, is it the right thing to do? And I don't think the machines, you know, at least at this point in time, can, can make those decisions for us. So I think, if anything, we need to up the education around ethics, you know? Yeah, the content and the ethical training of, of, of professionals, yeah. which is, architecture had a bit of it in it. It seemed that the philosophy was more along uh, aesthetics rather than, than ethics. Yeah, exactly. But I think you're right. It's the wisdom and, and the ethics. You mentioned Thomas Friedman. Who are some of the other writers and thinkers on sustainability and climate change adaptation or regeneration whom you most admire and why? Um, honestly, it's, you know, kind of the ordinary people that manage to make the topic accessible to others that really impress me. It's the people that manage to do things at scale. So, you know, like a one-off building is great, but it's the people that come up with something that you can translate across a larger spectrum. I think technology is important, but I think we really need to be making robust buildings that, that prioritize passive design principles. At the Green Building Festival a couple of years ago, I think you were speaking at this one too, Craig, Russell Acton of Acton Austria spoke, you know, he designed yes. yep. commons. And what I loved about the way that he spoke about mass timber was he talked about mass timber as a, as a low carbon strategy, which of course we're all talking about. But instead of talking about the beauty of wood and it being all about the aesthetic, to him, it was about optimizing it down to something that was affordable that could be built at scale. And I thought, wow, that's the first time I've heard someone talk about mass timber in this way. And I thought, here's someone who's sort of set out to systematically and intentionally scale something. I thought, that's brilliant. I, you know, when I first looked at it, I went, oh, but where's the wood? You can't see the wood. But then the more, I, when I listened to him speak about his intention, I thought, well, that's a bit of brilliance there. So, 
Another person who I have to say I love within the industry, and I think you, you've interviewed him, is Eric Corey Freed. Mm-hmm. And I oh, love he, He's the a difficult way person to interview because he's, he's half stand-up comedian. He is absolutely that. He's hilarious. He's it's hilarious. It's just like, really hard to keep a straight face when you're interviewing that guy. Yeah. <laughs> but he makes it accessible. He makes it humorous. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it can be a really serious topic, right? It can be a really serious topic. And he finds a way to make it humorous. You know, like he, he had this, this image of the manholes in the street, you know, that weren't lined up. Like they had the, the, the line from the road painted across them. Yeah. And then they'd been put back without being lined up. And of course, as an architect, it's the kind of thing that drives you crazy. And he had like 15 pictures of this. And he's like, and this is, this is how people think. I just don't understand. You know, I thought... <laughs> He just, he has a way of, of making things accessible. In our interview, he said, I asked him, well, like, was he always like a class clown? He said, no, I actually was from a, a class that all had class clowns in it. But he said, he did stand up comedy and he found that when he was giving presentations about climate change, everyone just sort of looked sad in their seats and there was no energy in the room. And yet when he go to stand up, everyone was like alive and energy. And he said, wait a minute. <laughs> I need to bring some of the energy from stand-up into my climate change conversations and presentations. And so he did. And of course, that's why he does have that, that ability to inspire, which, which really, it's funny, isn't it, how our profession is very serious. Oh, it's very and humor isn't typically something that we really feel comfortable engaging with. So I'm glad you brought that up. It's, it, it, humor is a potential for getting that message across. Yeah, for really accessing people, right? Then the third person I had on the list was uh, Jason McLennan and, you know, Living Building Challenge. And, yes. you know, I haven't yep. had the opportunity to, to build one yet in my career. I, I think you have though, right, Craig? Yeah. I think you've done it. Yep. Yeah, that's great. It was a real challenge. And the part of it that was most challenging was the red list. Right. Which yeah, yeah. Uh, of the 25 chemical compounds that you can't have. And it does one thing very well shows you how toxic our building environment is yeah i mean i I, i'm a biologist by training originally i know what those chemicals do but even though i spent 25 years working with them i never realized how embedded they are in all of our building materials it's frightening and it was really hard to find materials we could use to build the building it was it was wild yeah exactly there's something you could use some ai for to make this figure those things out for us. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, what I loved about, you know, the, the living building challenge and the fact that he, he saw a need and he filled it yeah. and he created this sort of simple, hard, yeah. but simple, beautiful system. And, and, you know, beauty is one of the ingredients of it. Yeah. And I, and I, yeah. and I love that. And we often forget to put that in all these different, you know, sort of sustainability certifications that we put in. And I love that he made that. Right. There's check marks and boxes as opposed to petals. Yeah. Yeah. It's about the fact that you see a need and you fill it. You're not just waiting for someone else to do it, but you, you see something and you do it. And to me, these are the people that inspire me, right? Is, is the people that sort of take it on and make it theirs and, and try to make something happen. What do you think are the biggest challenges and barriers to coming to grips with how to meet the realities of climate change and the necessity to not only reduce our emissions, but also adapt to the impacts of climate change. What do you think? What are the biggest challenges and barriers? Well, I mean, you know, we've seen, you know, through the pandemic, the resilience of people, of individuals, especially people in communities that aren't supported by strong social infrastructure. They've been let down before and, you know, they've been let down again. And I think when the systems aren't there to assist them, when you're worried about feeding yourself and housing and paying for your housing, how can you think about the environment? How can you make different choices? How can yeah, so you economic inequality? Economic inequality is huge. Yeah. And and realizing that we are all tied together, you know, if you're not doing well, that impacts me. And so how do we find a way to bring people up? And so to me, I, I think that's that's a major barrier. And then when I think about the built form side, I think about existing buildings, right? That stat that 80% of the buildings that are going to be here in 2050 are already here. That's, that's kind of staggering, right? And Oh, I, 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 so, I so agree with you there because sometimes I think, 
Wow. So we've just done our lead building this year, which is 0.001% yes, exactly. of all the buildings out there. Like, what are we doing exactly. about the rest of them? You know, and when you start to, it's like, I can celebrate this one, you know, perfect, beautiful building that I've done. But what about, you know, this is back to the thing about scaling it. And so yeah. what are we going to do about the existing buildings? You know, there aren't, ex- there aren't regulations that exist around adaptation, either for new buildings or existing buildings, but for the existing buildings, there's nothing even to bring them up to current regulation, let alone take them to beyond that. And we know how to make better buildings. It's just, how are we going to do this? How are we going to scale that? I I don't have a solution to this one at this point, other than my idea about the innovation system at the scale of a community. You know, I think we have to ask the people that live in those buildings what they think they need. What doesn't work when the power goes down? What's the problem? Mm -hmm. Does this one room keep flooding? Is this side of the building overheating? What do we need to address? Because I don't think we can do a blanket solution. I think that where we're going to find some traction is in this concept of asking people what they've needed that they haven't gotten and finding a way to help them to get that. I like that because instead of you telling me what you think the biggest challenges and barriers, I'm hearing you say there's a lot of them, but most importantly is we need to ask the people that are going to be experiencing them as opposed to me just telling you. So that's very genuine. And I think that leads to maybe the next question I wanted to ask you, which is what about the opportunities? What are some of the key opportunities to deal with fast emerging challenges that we're facing impacts of climate change and adaptation like? I suspect that one of them is engagement. We've talked about it throughout some of these questions, but I'll let you answer the question. Yeah, no, I I think engagement is definitely a huge part. So, you know, I think about our, you know, our concept, the neighborhood nest concept. That's something that's totally doable in an existing building. And one of the things we did when we did this study is we mapped out where all the community centers were, where all the libraries were, and then we mapped out where all the rental buildings are, all the apartment buildings are. And we said, wow, look at that. If you tied all those things together, what could that become? So to me, there is some opportunity to start to network these buildings together. I mean, it's, it's, mm-hmm. don't get me wrong, it's going to be challenging. These are often owned by private companies and stuff. But if we could find a way to connect this mm-hmm. and use these existing buildings as part of our social infrastructure, I think there's something really key in that. Yeah. And if they're condos and condo boards can act as a group, so there's certainly some potential. And it sounds like what you were talking about before with AI, with AI, you may be able to better understand what some of these pieces are in a bigger picture. Yeah, actually, yeah. Now that you put that out there, imagine if you could tie together the needs of each of these communities, of each of these buildings. And if someone had more of this and someone had less of this, like how could you find a way to almost community share across buildings? Imagine if you could do something. Yeah. I think you're onto something there, Craig. Got to talk about this some more. We'll talk about this (laughs) after the podcast. One of the things I like to ask my guests is, Something that doesn't get talked about a lot because we're so inundated with the challenges of pulling back on our emissions and now adapting, but talking about the future and what we're going to do to repair the damage we've done. How do we regenerate our environment? How do some of our solutions not just sort of patch up the holes, but look at a future that's better and an environment that's actually you know, more robust. What do you think? I mean, it's, there's no right answer, but what, yeah. what are your thoughts on this? Like, really? My, my biggest one is trees. I think trees are a fundamental. Um, I don't know if you saw American Forest. They created that new data tool called the Tree Equity Score. Have you seen I, this? You know what? I did, but I haven't looked into Very it. I, cool. I'm, a, I'm a big tree fan as well. So I'm really happy to hear you say that. You have that. to check this thing out because it allows people to see where urban trees exist and where they don't. And, you know, to our earlier conversation, there is a direct correlation between tree coverage and social equity. Oh, yes. Which I found yeah. not really surprising. No, and it's but it, it, it's like in it. neighborhoods that are wealthy have more trees and neighborhoods that aren't have fewer. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, trees, they provide shade, they add beauty, you know, they reduce stress, reduce 
you know, need for heating and cooling. And so when you look at this map, you can sort of overlay where there's issues of income in racialized neighborhoods, especially in cities. You think about how policy affects things, the redlining policies in the U.S. and then in the 1900s, where they would kind of redline neighborhoods and say, you know, too much risk here. And that was often, you know, related to race. And you can now see this coming up in these maps where they do have less trees as a result. So I think tree planting programs- Things they weren't invested in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So they divested from these neighborhoods. Yeah. So imagine putting out tree planting programs in these neighborhoods, doing that as a part of, of, of social service, right? If, if that became a part of what we did, you know, we've got sort of our, you know, the municipal forestry departments, but what if we made it a part of what we did as part of our, you know, what we're giving back to our communities? Yeah, I, I think that that's a wonderful point of departure. And, and in fact, I, I want to talk about density, but before we go there, a few months ago, the Thomas Crowther Lab at ETH Zurich published a paper in the journal Science about the capacity of the planet for planting trees to reduce CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. You may have seen that. It was big news for a while. I believe they said something like that, that the available land that was not farmland, existing forest, or human habitation would allow us to plant somewhere in the order of 1.3 trillion trees, yeah. which would take like 10 years of CO2 of the atmosphere. So how does that work for cities? What do you think the opportunities are there for uh, us planting trees and improving our urban forest canopy? I think it's I think it's huge, Greg. Like I think it's I think it's a critical part of what we need to be doing. I think if you look at this data tool with from American Forests, I think they talk a bit about tree equity, and they say you know nationally that they require planting with something like 522 million trees in places with populations of 50,000 or greater. It's a huge amount of trees, but you can imagine if that became a part of it. Mm -hmm. Here in the city of Toronto, I mean, we live in a pretty green city, you know, with our ravine infrastructures and such. So we're doing pretty well, but a lot of the trees in the older neighborhoods are also getting older. And so we need to find a way to replant those things. Um, yeah, and we have a Norway maple invasion problem as well. Oh, I don't know. Have you walked through High Park lately with the caterpillars? The, mm-hmm. the invasive, like yeah. some of them have been. Yeah, that's another. That, that's, a whole other, that's a whole other issue, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I definitely, like the potential of a tree planting program, like I'd love to see that, you know, you think about high school students that have to put in so many hours of community service. What if you had, you know, an urban tree planting program as part of that? I think that's. It's total potential. Well, if you want to start it, I'll, I'll back you up. <laughs> I've got lots of people that would be yeah. interested in supporting that. So you are very interested from your resume and our conversation about multi-unit residential. So that's all about density. And the density of cities has a huge impact on greenhouse gas emissions per capita, doesn't it? The denser the city, the lower the emissions per capita. However, it's often equipped. It's not how dense you make a city that counts. It's how you make it dense. What are your thoughts on density as a strategy for reducing per capita greenhouse emissions? And how dense can we make our cities and still create humane and great places to live? Yeah, that's a big one. I mean, living... I mean, that's like an hour question to answer, but you know, it's 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 one of my favorite questions. Yeah, I mean, you know, vertical neighborhoods, I think we need to start to think about the quality of space within a tower. So thinking about breaking them up into to vertical parts of neighborhoods, uh, breaking the building up with social spaces, you know, let's say every five floors having a social space that's connected to it. We've looked at having social spaces per floor. We've looked at things like widening corridors, almost making uh, front porches within off a corridor. Yeah. I mean, all of these things take away from, you know, saleable areas. So you have to be, you know, to weigh these things. But in terms of qualities of space, you know, like even just a little recess at your front door where you could put a little chair and run into a neighbor, we've looked at things like um, putting a glass side light, you know, beside your door so that you can see in to see if somebody's home. Right. Pieces like yeah. that. So eyes on the, Jane Jacobs, eyes on the exactly, street. Exactly. Eyes on the yeah. street. You know, in terms of carbon as well, you know, one of the other things that happens when we build in cities is we tend to do a lot of underground parking. And, you know, in our embodied carbon studies that we've done recently, the real answer is to not build underground because the underground is incredibly carbon intensive. 
So moving away from parking minimums, you know, the writing letters of advocacy, uh, you know, they're re-looking at the parking requirements in the city of Toronto. So like removing those, why have them? The market can dictate whether we need them or if not. If you can walk to where you work and where you buy your food, you don't need to have a car. Yeah. You look at things like um, Active TO, where we suddenly had all these bike lanes that I've been dreaming of, you know, because I've been looking at the maps and wanting them there for years. Suddenly, I can bike all the way across Bloor Street, and, you know, I'm not always afraid for my life. You know, this is important. These are important pieces about making the right kind of density. So, you're putting the right kinds of buildings, but you need the infrastructure to support it. Without mm-hmm. that infrastructure, it's just a bunch of mass, but you need places for people to participate so take up less room for cars you know or the cafe to pro- that's amazing right I, yeah you know oh it's actually this is one of the wonderful things of the pandemic is people having to eat al fresco although they're right beside the street yeah. the cars have been forced to slow down because there's fewer there's less space for them to move yeah. and so you have the streets animated it's wonderful well we needed yeah. wide wider sidewalks in toronto for sure yeah absolutely so if we Take away some of the street, take it back for people. I think we'll have a lot more success with that. And we just, we need to have enough green spaces. I mean, we have got this green roof bylaw in the city of Toronto. We need to start to make these active green roofs, you know, intensive green roofs where you've got trees and, and social spaces outside. And we've done that to a certain extent. Um, but where the way people that people can experience them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the way that the bylaw is written, because you can subtract the amount of amenity space that you're providing you end up with a little bit less than useful spaces, but really being able to capitalize on on those pieces, providing the social infrastructure really is what it comes down to for me, Craig. Like you can, you can make density as long as you provide the social infrastructure, indoor, outdoor, all of it. People need to connect and talk to each other. I hope you're enjoying this episode of the 21st Century Imperative podcast. We've certainly enjoyed producing it. As you know, 21st Century is a not-for-profit venture but we still have production costs. So to help cover these costs, we've launched a new online store with all proceeds going to cover production. And we have some great products for you. We have organic fair trade t-shirts and hoodies, as well as non-toxic BPA-free coffee containers, all with great graphics. So if you like the podcast, please think about helping us out by buying a t-shirt, hoodie, or mug for you and one for each of your friends head over to our website at tfcipodcast.com and click on the 21st Century Store button. Let me ask you this question. You've got a very cool role entitled Director of Innovation. That's cool. Tell us about some of the more innovative, effective, and consequential ideas you are seeing and hearing about in that role. Like You're a magnet for those kinds of things. What, yeah. what are you seeing? What, what can you tell our listeners that's really innovative, cool, effective, consequential? Yeah, I mean, honestly, Craig, everyone's talking about data. Data, 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 data. Data is in everything. Everyone wants to know how to collect it, what to do with it, what we're going to get out of it. So there's definitely giving a lot of thought to how to do that, how to process that just at the scale of our own firm, but also how to do that for the projects that we're building and to understand, again, in private sector development, the, it, it can be difficult to get information about your buildings after you build them. Um, So finding a way to close a loop. So things like digital twins Mm -hmm. and finding a way to, um, so you've basically got the building, the data to create the building, then you create the building, you've got sensors in the building, you tie those two things together. And now you have this model that you can use to iterate real time on things like that's, that's cool, right? Like that's really exciting. And that allows you to test your choices before you do them. I talked about the neighborhood nests. Um, we've had a lot of interest in that, which has been really exciting. You know, when you come up with a concept project and there's some uptake. So now we're starting to work with a handful. Of it's got a great name too, Michelle. Yeah, that was... Just, uh, just the name sounds like something you want to be involved with. Ah, oh, that's great. That's so good to hear. I'll, I'll tell Ken because this was his. We all voted internally on it and... and it's it's that alliteration, right? The, well, the, there's going to be a lot of people that now <laughs> hear about it because of this podcast. <laughs> That's great. Um, so now we're really trying to, with that one, it's about making it proof of concept. You know, so you come up mm-hmm. with this idea and then how do you make it real? A lot of talk around design for manufacture, you know, lots of potential there uh, to build at scale and to use technology to do what it 
does best, right? So you think about the the way that we manufacture goods and you've got a lot of control of the supply chain. One of the things that happens in architecture, everything is bespoke. Everything is bespoke. So you don't have a lot of control each time you're bidding for each piece. And imagine if you were uh, designing with a mindset of manufacturing, it changes things completely. And now you think about these materials, you know, you're talking about, uh, you know, the toxins and materials. If you had those coming out of a single place and, and this was where things are being created from, you have a lot more control. There's more safety for the workers. There's more control, less waste. So there's definitely something in that piece. And I think, I think it's starting. You're seeing pockets of it, but it hasn't fully materialized because to me, it's not really clear who's going to own that space yet. Is it going to be from the contractor side? Is it going to be from the developer side? Is it going to be from the architect side? I think, I actually think the way that we make buildings is likely going to change. I'm not sure who, like, I think the architect will still be there for the vision, but I think our way of building, because I think there's a bit of a disconnect within our field around the design of buildings and the realization of buildings. And I think those two processes need to get closer together. Mm -hmm. Although, we're also seeing constructors, when you and I started our architectural careers, constructors, contractors, and architects and engineers were so far apart. And there was a set of drawings, stip sum, and they got it, and then you fought with them over the construction. Whereas now, constructors are sophisticated, yes. they're engineers, they're MBAs, they're making IT decisions. There's a, a real sophistication there. So I suspect there's, that's possible for, for coming together. Yeah. So it's one thing that, as you say, may be missing from the discussion. What else do you think is missing from the discussion of climate change and climate change adaptation? Are there any other questions or better questions we should be asking? Well, when, you know, when I thought about the, what's missing from the discussion, it's... I think we've got the voices of the professionals. I think we need the voices of the people living in our communities and the people living in our buildings. I was at a presentation by the World Green Building Council, and they had this one slide. It was just, just a little pie chart that described who was at the table and contributed to the discussion. And I thought it was so interesting mm -hmm. because it showed you how heavily weighted it was towards professionals being a part of the conversation compared to other people, like where were, where were the healthcare workers? You know, where were the people making the stuff? Where were the people operating the buildings? And they were often missing. And I think by kind of reporting out on that, it holds you accountable to knowing who you need to engage. And again, speaking to how technology can help us, right? Who are we engaging? Mm -hmm. And how are we engaging them? And so once you know who's missing, you can start to figure out how to engage them in the discussion. And again, I come back to that idea of this um, innovation strategy at the scale of a, of a municipality, I feel like is, is really, really key here to getting those voices heard. Yeah, and the voices heard with the intent of making a positive difference and contribution. And I think even your title is all about progress. Innovation is implicit in that word is, is progress. I think most people who care deeply about our planet implicitly believe in the notion of progress. Otherwise, why bother? But lately, that belief is being severely tested. Brexit, the rise of the right in Europe, and most recently, and unfortunately, Trump's presidency and the center staging of the right in the United States, all are giving us progressives and liberals great anxiety about progress. What do you think about the idea of progress? And and the idea that we can make a positive difference in the world. What do you think? Well, at the beginning of the pandemic, I did a lot of reading. I did a lot of reading through the pandemic, actually. And I reopened, you know, the seven habits of highly effective people by Stephen, Stephen Covey. Covey. And coming back to that was, was important for me because like I was, I was feeling disheartened by some of the things that I was seeing out there for sure. And what I loved about returning to this book is it reminded me about this concept of, of leading from a principled center, you know, making decisions from a place of principle. So if you know what your principles are, if you know what you believe in and who you are, you always apply this. You apply this to everything that you do. And, and that, that's, that's the desire. So he, he talks about this idea of this circle of concern. 
which is really everything that you're worried about. And you think about how much there is to be worried about these days. There's a lot going on. It's easy to, to get pulled in so many directions that you don't know what to work on anymore, what to concentrate on. And I love his really simple diagram. It's the big circle of everything that you're worried about. It. And then he puts a smaller circle inside it and says, this is your circle of influence. And in this circle of influence, if you put all your energy into this circle of influence, into just changing to operating within that space, influencing the person beside you, the person who sits beside you and saying, yeah, I think this is the way to do it. I think this, you know, if you work within that. What's interesting about it is it then grows your circle of influence. And so I feel like the more that message is understood, mm -hmm. the more people that are working from within their circle of influence. And this is back to that point about, you know, as architects, engineers, and planners, we've got all this power. Imagine if all of us are working from within our circle of influence to do the right thing, how much we have the ability to change the built environment. To me, that's something that, that really appeals to me. So I think about our, our governments and... There's often a lot of bureaucracy and red tape within a government. And so if governments could start to really work within their circles of influence as well and push on that and as companies and as citizens, because I think we've got a lot of change to make and we have to do this in a, you know, in a shortened timeline. And I think to do that, we all need to kind of be at our best and working, working from our centers. So are you hopeful? What keeps you going mm. when things look dark? Yeah, I mean, I think there's going to be some tough times that we're going to have to go through. But honestly, it, it, it's people that give me hope. It's people that continue to push through when, when things are tough. It's people that get up every morning and keep trying to make a difference every day. People that choose to be, you know, lifelong learners and are constantly trying to make things better. We have the technology to do everything we need to do, and now we need the political will to, to do the follow-through. A book I've been meaning to read, I don't know if you've probably read this, Craig, you've read so much, is The, the Future We Choose. Have you read that one? No, I haven't. Okay. okay. I've, um, I've heard, it's on my list. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, we'll, we'll read it together and correspond. Okay, sounds good. So many people have in the last two weeks have suggested I read that. So it's uh, it, it's very interesting I, that you should. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been suggested to me a couple of times. And um, it's Christina Figueres and Tom Rivet Karnak. And they were essential to to the, the Paris Climate Agreements, to, to getting people all on side. Mm -hmm. And so... The book is about two futures. There's a reason I've hesitated to read this book because it, it talks about the two futures. What happens if we keep things as they are, the status yeah. quo, and what happens if we do what needs to be done and we act upon it? And I think the reason I've hesitated is because I don't necessarily want to see what happens if we don't do anything. Mm -hmm. But they, again, are about creating the vision of where we need to go because I think we can't go to that dark vision. We have to go to where we need to go. And when I think about that and I think about the people who are doing the right thing and I think about these very knowledgeable people that say we have the technology. It's only at this point in time in our history that we have had the technology to do what needs to be done. So now we just have to do it. And I mean, you know, we've seen through COVID that change can happen quickly. You know, we were able to pay people a living wage for a period of That's time. That's been one of the wonderful benefits of COVID, isn't it? Yeah, right? that, exactly. That we, we've seen it. And all the things that you could never do before, all of a sudden you can do. Exactly. So, it's things like that. Like, riding my bike on the Bloor Street bike lanes gives me hope because that happened and it happened fast. Yeah. You know, seeing people eating on the streets, that gives me hope. Yeah. Like, it's, it's those things. It's where we've managed to accelerate, see what needs to be done and take care of it. What about our listeners? What advice would you like to offer them about what they can do to be part of making a difference in meeting the challenges of the 21st century imperative and maintaining hope? So I'd say if you are in a position of power, you really need to acknowledge the power that you have to make a difference and speak up. That pretending that you don't have it is a disservice to yourself and to others. So use it to advocate, to organize, to, and to mostly to empower the young people around you. They have big ideas. They've been learning about this, you know, from day one. It's been part of their education. And we need to combine our experience, our wisdom with their ingenuity 
and their willingness to engage technology because they have the skills and we have some wisdom. And I think we need to find a way to combine those things in a very real way to make change happen. And I think as architects, we need to just be having these conversations on, on every project, regardless of whether it's a, a, a priority for the client. I think we need to be having the conversation. It should just be a standard. And we need to learn the language that is understood by the people we're speaking to and speak it. And, you know, finally, I think just that learning mindset, just never stop learning. We can't, we can't stop. Like it, it used to be that you, you had your education and then you stopped. I mean, as professionals, we always had to do continuing education, but I think this is, this is more than continuing education. This is lifelong learning. It doesn't stop because the change is continuing to happen. It's going to continue to happen at an accelerated rate. So we have to find a way to tap in and find our sources, find our sources of inspiration. Thank you. That's very, very good advice. Well, finally, I'd like to ask three rapid fire questions that I ask my guests at the end of an interview to wrap us up. The first question is what books related to these issues do you most often recommend or gift to other people? I think one of them, I don't know if you've read this one, Craig, Zugan Ruha by Jason McLennan. No, I haven't. I, I, you've got me tw twice. <laughs> okay, twice. Wow, you've yeah, read so but much. But it is on my list of, okay. of, of books I must read. <laughs> so, the, the, so Zugan Ruha, the subtext is that the inner migration to profound environmental change. And uh, Zugan Ruha is all about birds before they migrate, where they mm -hmm. gather and they make a lot of noise and they get really excited before they, they go on their, their big quest. And I loved that that was his reference for the, for the name of the book. But there were a couple of key things in there. He has one chapter, I, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it's something like ideas three quarters baked. Mm. It's like change needs to happen, needs to happen quickly. It's, it's like progress, not perfection. You get something to it, like neighborhood nests, you know, like to think it's more than three quarters baked, but now we need to do proof of concept. So you put these ideas out there in the world that are three quarters baked and say, hey, we think what this is think? a really great yeah. concept. Let others take them. You know, yeah. what do you think? You yeah. take it all. The yeah. Now you take it and you build on to it. And I thought that was, that was so beautiful and very much in line with the way I think about this. And then also this idea within the book is about, you know, individual efforts that ripple out ripple outward and have evolutionary change to improve things for people, for the planet, you know? And I thought those, those are the main concepts in that one. They're very poetic metaphors. Yeah, very much so. And then a podcast, not a book. I've been really enjoying lately Simon Sinek's A Bit of oh, Optimism. Oh, yes, yes. Really? He, he was yeah. the, the fellow that helped us in our firm inspire our why. Like yeah. about 10 years yeah. ago, we said, well, we all care about making a difference. What is it that we're going to do about it? And it was his book, For Start With Why, that really helped launch that path down the road. Yeah, no, he's, he's wonderful. His TED Talk helped me enormously, you know, early on in my career and helped me with my public speaking, helped me. I was a very shy public speaker. I didn't like to present. And that was something where it was... Start with the why. People don't care what you do. They care why you're doing it. And once they can connect to you, then, then they're hooked, right? That's as good as any book. We'll definitely have that on, in the show notes as one of the, yeah. the books, the podcast. We'll say, you know what? I'm going to ask podcasts or books now because now everything, or audibles, right? Yeah, it's true. It's true. And the second question, if you had the power to implement one change, one innovation, or one policy in cities around the world that would have the effect of significantly reducing CO2 emissions or helping cities better adapt to climate change, what would it be and why? Okay, so this is uh, a bit out there. <laughs> Combines with my tree planting idea, though. I like it. <laughs> so I had this thought about this, like a program for public service. So tell a little bit of story to go with this, okay? So the Michigan Women's Music Festival I used to attend and it's a music festival, all for women, obviously, in Michigan. And at the time, 
it was organized into communities very specifically based on what the needs were. So if it was women with children, if it was women over a certain age, if it was women that wanted to stay up all night, if it was so that's how that sort of the camping was was organized. And when you got there, you sort of said where you wanted to go. And then you had to sign up for two work shifts, two four hour work shifts in a in a week. You had to do one in the kitchen. And the other one, you could choose whatever it was you wanted to do. So I thought, oh, okay, well, whatever you go. So you'd go to do these works. So you'd, the rest of the time, you'd be seeing music. You'd be doing whatever you wanted to do. But what I loved about this is at first, it seemed like, oh, I have to do work. It's my vacation. And then you found yourself in the kitchen, you know, chopping of vegetables. You did whatever had to be done when you got there. And it was extremely well organized. It was like you and 10 other people in this workshop you're talking. And suddenly you knew all these people. You were contributing to the meal that was about to be served. And it became a part of it. And then my second work shift, I think I did in the the crafts tent. So I was working with the, the crafts women. And it was right after a storm. And I had to help them sort of put something back together. You know, their tent had fallen in and I had to put it back together for them. And And I thought, I learned so much. And I met all these people. And it was because I was put into this position of having to do some public service. And I think it's, I feel like it's something that's a little bit missing these days, unless you belong to, you know, some kind of a community group, a church group, something like that. Mm -hmm. But I thought, imagine if like, you know, tree planting or garbage picking or water testing, if that was something that was just sort of built into what we did within a, within a community, a way to get to know your neighbors, a way to, to, to band together and figure out what needs to be done. And we think we don't have time for these things, right? You think you don't have time, but what happens when you do something like this you is suddenly time. time becomes more abundant yeah. because you make all these connections and all of this, this magic kind of starts to happen. So that, that was my thought. Usually people answer this question with a policy idea that might be implemented. I think you have a really good idea. You should just start to do this. And, and I'll put my hand up. I'll help. That <laughs> I, I agree 100%. I, okay. I, when I look at what happened uh, with Roosevelt's um, initiatives to deal with the depression and the, the various work cores and tree planting cores and forest cores, I thought, what a great thing. It got people out. It got them planting trees. It got them doing public good. And they benefited from it because they were getting paid. But they also connected, and they connected to their communities. And I think you're right. It's absolutely missing. It's Everything is atomized right yeah. now. So, yeah, let's, let's do that. Well, that sounds and, awesome. And you connect around the betterment of your community. And then yeah. you start to take pride in your community. So, you know, that piece around what happened in Chicago. Once you take pride in your civic space, you start to care for it. You're going to care if someone throws garbage on the ground. You're going to care yeah. if someone damages a tree. So, you're going to do something about it. Yeah. You know, if you, if you, feel, if you feel invested well, not only that, but as you said, it's about building social infrastructure. It's about future resilience. And one of the things we have to do is we will face the impacts, really significant impacts of climate change. We need a social infrastructure. And it sounds like one of the ways to move us in that direction. So very, very appropriate. The last question might relate to this. I don't know. Um, if you could publish a full page spread in the Sunday New York Times or the Globe and Mail or, or online on a website, maybe, of anything you wanted, written or graphic, what would it be? Yeah, this is a tough one, Craig. Um. <laughs> <laughs> because you have a lot of ideas, right? <laughs> I think I just come back to the Stephen Covey idea. You know, I think I love the idea of a full page in the paper being a big circle with all the things people are worrying about climate change and the pandemics and you know everything that we're worried about and then just like a circle in the middle that just has you know the words like your face here and it's work from your circle of influence we know you're worried about a lot but just stay right here and then that will grow and so you could almost dot the circle outside of it of what it could grow into mm-hmm. if you really focus on your circle of influence. It would be a very simple and powerful graphic. Yeah. I think if you have some sort of web page or blog, that should be the, the symbol at, at the top. <laughs> okay. I really should do something. A closing question. Is there anything that you would like to ask of our listeners? I think, you know, seek optimism. I don't think I'm an optimist at heart. I've had to go looking for it. And especially through this pandemic, I have had to dig deep. I think as we all have, 
you know, I very early on had to change my, I, I was getting up every morning and just sitting down at my computer and working from seven, seven till seven, seven till 10, whatever, just work, work, work. And I realized it wasn't working for me. And so I changed my, I changed my morning routine and I started going out for like a, an hour long walk through High Park. And I started having some of my best ideas doing that. I started having new ideas. I started to listen to podcasts. I started to sort of feed my mind with what I wanted to be thinking about. And that's how I found, um, that's how I found your podcast. It's how I found, you know, Simon Sinek's podcast, some great storytelling podcasts like The Moth. Um, so I'd say seek out optimism because, you know, what we're going through isn't easy and what's to come is not going to be easy. There's a, there's a lot of challenges a lot is changing and a lot is changing quickly and we have to find a way to find our center so that we can persist because there's infinite possibilities that remain and we have to start thinking in those terms. So, yeah, that's my thought. That's lovely. And, you know, Michelle, when I transcribe the podcast, one of the things I have to do is look for something that would be the right subtitle beside your name. And I think you just gave it to the podcast, Seek Out Optimism. Great. It's lovely. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And finally, how can people reach you or connect with you on social media? What kind of connection points would you like to see them connect with you? Because I, I'm sure there are going to be some people very interested in this podcast. Yeah, so... I think ideally, you know, my work email, so mshwerab at bdpquadrangle.com. And I do have a LinkedIn page. I am not judicious about <laughs> checking my messages on there, but I do have a page there if you want to see what I'm up to. But I think email is really the best. Okay. Um, I we'll, do have a Twitter account we'll, as well, but I can't be relied upon to, uh, to, connect. to respond yeah. to that either. So. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. That was lovely. Thanks, Craig. This has been, it's been a pleasure. So thank you for, for the invite. You can find links to more information about this podcast and to notes about the books and references we've discussed at tfcipodcast.com. And if you like the podcast, please let us know by rating it on the Apple iTunes podcast website and by sponsoring the podcast on our Patreon sponsor page at patreon.com forward slash TFCI podcast. This podcast is ad free and relies entirely on listener support from people like you. So if you find our podcast interesting and valuable, please consider becoming a patron. Your sponsorship will not only help us cover the cost of production, but we will also be spending 50 cents of every sponsorship dollar to plant trees. To do this, we have formed a partnership with Community Forest International, who will not only be planting seedlings for you, but taking care of them to make sure they continue to grow and absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So please head over to the Patreon page and become a sponsor. Until next time, thanks for listening.